All right, good morning. So I'm the main developer of VMD. VMD is a visual, uh, molecular visualization and analysis program. It is designed to handle a diversity of uh, molecular structure information. Uh, it can also show quantum chemistry data, uh, sequence alignments, uh, various other types of analytical processes that are interesting to researchers. And over the years, we have uh, been adapting VMD to scale up to much larger size problems. And some of the main goals of the work that are done in our field are basically using the computer as a form of computational microscope. So the goal of our work is to use a computer to see time scales and structural details that are currently inaccessible to experimental imaging methodologies. And we do this uh, using uh, all atom molecular dynamics simulations running on clusters and supercomputers. So the size of these simulations has grown tremendously. If you look at this plot, I started working in this field in approximately 1998. And in that, in that era, the largest size simulations that were being conducted were on the order of 10,000 atoms. Uh, if you look forward to 2014, uh, the HIV simulation that was published last year was uh, 64 million atoms. And there are currently people producing 100 million and 200 million atom simulations. So the size of the problems has grown so much uh, that we have to take a, a serious look at uh, ways of speeding up not only the simulations themselves, but also the analysis and visualization of the, those simulations. So one particular kind of simulation that's very interesting to us is what we call a molecular dynamics flexible fitting. And this technique is basically an approach that takes very high resolution x-ray crystallography structures and combines them with low resolution but uh, faithfully uh, represented shapes uh, for biological molecules. The problem with crystallography is to get that all atom detail, they have to turn a protein into a crystal. And in doing that, they deform it in various ways. They have to do various uh, tricky chemistry to make that happen. And so by the time you get this uh, detailed all-atom structure, it may not be 100% representative of what happens in a normal biological scenario. So by combining these two types of imaging data together with uh, computer simulation, we're able to take the best of both worlds. We use the uh, physiologically correct but low-resolution cryo-electron microscope image, and we combine it with the all-atom crystal structure and we're able to get uh, all atom structure that is uh, faithful to the original biological scenario. So the way this is done in the simulation is by taking the cryo-electron density map and using it to create a force field that basically pulls on the atoms in the uh, molecular dynamics structure and causes them to fall into the same conformation as the, the real physiological uh, model that, or physiological object did. And by doing that, we are, we are making the simulation. It's still obeying all the laws of physics. Uh, the atoms aren't going to do something unnatural. That's ensured by the molecular dynamics force field. But we're using the experimental imaging data to correct uh, that all atom model. This is basically the technique that uh, combining imaging data over a decade uh, with a huge petascale computer simulation. My team uh, at the University of Illinois, directed by Klaus Schulten, and teams at uh, several other universities were able to solve the all-atom structure of the HIV-1 uh, virus capsid. One of the challenges, uh, and this is more what I work on, one of the challenges in uh, working with these simulations is evaluating the quality of that fit between the X-ray crystal structure that's been corrected in the molecular dynamics simulation and matching it to one of these uh, cryo-electron density maps. And so the way that this is conventionally done over many years was to <coughs> uh, create a synthetic density map from the all atom crystal, simulated all atom crystal structure, and basically make a, a synthetic density map and do a uh, Pearson correlation comparing that density map against the real density map uh, produced by a microscope. And so basically, we're emulating what would the micro microscope have seen if it looked at the structure that was produced by the computer. And so then we can get a number for that, from that uh, calculation uh, that basically evaluates how well do they match. Is there a good match or is there a poor match? The problem with this is we don't just want to do this once. We want to do this thousands of times. 
and we want to do it not just for the whole structure, but we want to evaluate that quality of fit for small regions of the structure. So in this example here, you can see a, a time uh, window with the time on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis is which part of the structure. And we've got it color coded where regions that are blue are uh, an area of good fit and regions of red are an area where there's a problem. And in the example A here, you can see there's a part of the structure that even after undergoing simulation, it's sticking out of the uh, cryo-electron density map. So there's something that has to be fixed there. Well, doing this calculation is tremendously intensive. And up until now, we didn't have a means of doing this calculation with that much detail, uh, and certainly not on a desktop computer. Even doing one or two steps on a desktop computer is very time consuming. So we needed a, a way to solve this. And we've used GPUs to accelerate many other algorithms. And so we basically applied it uh, to this problem. So the benefit of having done this, now for the first time, we can get a very high resolution image showing a, a spatially localized fitting match between the crystal structure and the electron density map. And so in this example, we've colored this region red where it doesn't fit very well. And you can color it blue then when it's correct. And this is one of those things where if, even looking at it by your eye, it's very hard to see that there's anything wrong there. But by doing a very careful analysis, we can identify these problems immediately. So the challenge is, though, uh, you know, we can put this calculation on a GPU, but uh, there is a lot of uh, data analytical uh, algorithms in this process. We end up walking over a large number of data structures. We make a lot of memory references. And GPUs, uh, while they're very, they have very high memory bandwidth, they have al almost 60 times as much arithmetic capability as they do memory bandwidth. So in the time or in the... Uh, with the stream of data that you can produce uh, from GPU global memory, you could do 60 floating point operations for every one operand that you fetch from memory. And that's on current gener generation GPUs. As they continue to get faster and faster with uh, better arithmetic hardware, that ratio gets worse. So a critical thing in the design of our algorithm was finding a way to do this calculation in a single pass without traversing this big density map structure multiple times. And so we did this through a, a number of techniques, which involved first doing the calculation of the density values and the Pearson correlation in a single CUDA kernel. And the, the other optimizations revolve around uh, avoiding storing intermediate results to global memory or reading them back in. We do basically all of the work in the machine registers on the GPU. And this allows us to exploit the tremendous arithmetic uh, capabilities of the GPU uh, for this problem. So if we compare uh, our results then, the GPU accelerated version of this algorithm is more than 34 times faster than the previous best program that we knew about. And we made a, a CPU version of our code that so took a very similar approach. And with a two socket uh, Xeon E5, this is one of the uh, fastest Xeons you can get. Uh, one GPU is still about maybe one and a half times faster than a dual socket machine. That's quite an achievement. And so what's interesting about that now is we took something that took almost a minute before for, these are all small structures, by the way, of just 700,000 atoms or less. We took that and we have crushed that time now to half a second. So that means somebody can do this at the click of a button. What used to be a minute or two is now a click of a button. So the next thing is, we want to do this not one time, like I said. We want to do this t at least 10,000 times, and we want to do it in very uh, finely resolved structural detail for large things, uh, like beginning with the size of this uh, rabbit, rabbit hemorrhagic virus up in the right-hand corner. So if we were to do that, even with the GPU accelerated code running on one node, this would take almost 14 days. So to make this uh, feasible, we had to parallelize this on the Blue Waters supercomputer at Illinois. And running this on 100 nodes, we get about 105x speed up. And that takes it from two weeks down to three hours. And if we run it on 2,000 nodes, our scalability starts to taper off, but we get it down to about 19 minutes. And that's quite an achievement because there's both uh, disk I.O. involved, uh, reading and writing those uh, data sets, and uh, the computation <coughs> is a decreasing fraction of what we're doing. And so uh, if we did this 
with the original workstation code running on a desktop CPU, this would have taken uh, a researcher five years. So we've taken something that was really not possible before and developed a new tool using a combination of the GPU acceleration and multi-threading and also uh, large-scale parallelism on the big machines. One of the other things we've been working on just over the last year has been bringing uh, ray tracing techniques to desktop visualization and, and to supercomputer movie rendering. I've been developing ray tracing codes for almost 20 years, and we have been using these techniques in making publication figures for molecular visualization for as long as I've been involved in the field. But when we start working on these very large structures like HIV, 64 million atom systems, the scenes get tremendously large. Uh, the runtime for these things gets to be a problem, and so we wanted to find ways of, of speeding this up. And so uh, the benefits of ray tracing, if, you've, if you're not familiar, are it handles a lot of complex physical phenomena very easily. It's, in a ray tracer, it is very simple and straightforward to model things like shadows, and you can get uh, effects sort of like global illumination, such as ambient occlusion lighting. And while we're not really after a Hollywood image, what we are after is making an image that is immediately understandable. If you look at this image on the left that is shown with no shadows, this is more or less what you would see in a typical OpenGL visualization. Now, there are ways to do shadows in OpenGL, but they're very complicated and uh, they're prone to difficulties when you get to very large no amounts of geometry. Uh, by doing this stuff with a ray tracing technique, it's very straightforward. Besides the shading, uh, you know, the, the impression of depth, if you look at the image on the right, this looks very flat on the left. The one on the right, you can immediately see uh, pockets, cavities, and pores. Things, these are things that are of biological significance to a researcher, and so we want to make it sort of automatic. We're willing to spend a little bit of computing time to get an image like that because that image is far more useful to a researcher than the one on the left is. So last year we ported this code uh, on the G onto the GPU using uh, the NVIDIA optics library and running this on a large scale movie rendering job we were able to get about a factor of eight speed up uh, in the overall performance of our movie rendering. <coughs> in particular uh, the, the ray tracing gives us about a factor of six and we get a little bit more from improvements in using CUDA to generate molecular surfaces. By the time we run it on a large number of nodes, so with 256 nodes, you can see that out of the 288 seconds of runtime, the ray tracing time is only 171, and the rest of it is things like disk I.O. and staging the job and these other factors. And so we've basically gotten down to the point now where for jobs like this, we just have to focus on reducing I.O. Uh, to get further performance. So the way that this works in VMD, VMD was designed from the very beginning to allow a great deal of flexibility in its display uh, capabilities. We made basically a subclass of a uh, of, uh, scene generator for the NVIDIA optics library. And by doing that, we have all the same capabilities we would have uh, with the normal uh, built-in renderers. So more recently, we have now extended this so that you can do not only batch mode ray tracing for making movies or, or figures for publication, but now you can actually do this interactively, much like OpenGL. You can rotate the scene around. It will evaluate this complex lighting, uh, transparency, depth of field, focal blur, various other effects, and you can do this in real time. And so the way that this is done then is by converting what the batch mode renderer, renderer had originally done uh, into a, a series of steps, breaking out what had been a hard-coded loop into a progressive rendering loop that basically does a Monte Carlo sampling approach. It adds more and more samples as the renderer runs. So as you're, when you are rotating the scene, it is sort of starting from scratch. And as soon as you let go of the mouse and it it's, uh, sits there uh, stable, it basically accumulates more and more samples and the image quality improves uh, as you let it sit. And so uh, further advancement on that then <coughs> is the use of multiple GPUs. We can parallelize across multiple GPUs either by decomposing an image space. I've sort of color coded the image by little tiles that show it where a different GPU does the rendering for a different space. 
uh, or in a more sophisticated example, which is going to be shown here, uh, we can run on a cluster of GPUs. And in this case, we can uh, decompose the scene uh, both spatially and in terms of the samples. We can have different GPUs computing different Monte Carlo samples. They're all co-edited together, and then we get a final image, and it converges very quickly. And so this is actually being shown here today. If you go after my talk, if you go around to the, to the stage left, uh, or whatever it's called here, uh, you can actually see this running live. There is a cluster of GPUs in Santa Clara, California. It is running the ray tracer in real time, and the images that the ray tracer are generating are being sent via video compression uh, in real time back to the show floor here, so you can see them on the display. And you can actually rotate it around with the mouse. And so the, we can do the same thing, whether it's a desktop machine or a cluster. The benefit of the cluster is you can do this for a huge structure, and the convergence of those Monte Carlo samples is very, very fast. So we can do even very difficult uh, rendering effects, and you don't see artifacts and things like this. And so the demonstration is sort of a combination of remote visualization combined with the high quality rendering. And so my last comment is then to go see the live demos. <laughs>